A very good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought to you by Shankar Ayas Academy. Today I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 30th of May 2023 and displayed here are the list of news articles that we will be discussing today. You can go through it. At the end of the video we will also have practice prelims question discussion. So try to watch the entire video and a kind request to you all those who haven't yet subscribed our YouTube channel do subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular notifications about our future current affairs videos. Now let us get into our first news article discussion. Now have a look at this opaque article. This article is about the recent abuse of power by the Chief Justice of India. See to understand this editorial better. We must first familiarize ourselves with the concept of master of the rooster or first among equals. The term master of rooster refers to the Chief Justice of India's exclusive power to allocate cases to different benches of the Supreme Court. The term first among equals refers to the fact that the Chief Justice of India is the most senior judge in the Supreme Court but is not above the other Supreme Court judges. The Chief Justice of India is called the Master of Roster because the Constitution of India does not explicitly give any other body or person the power to allocate cases to different benches of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has held that the Chief Justice of India has this power by virtue of being the head of the Supreme Court. See the CJI's role as the Master of Roster is crucial in maintaining the smooth functioning of the court system and this also helps to ensure that the cases are assigned to appropriate judges. Okay, This is a basic about master of rooster or first among equals. Now moving on let us see the powers of CJI as the master of the rooster. The first power is regarding the constitution of benches. See the CJI has the authority to constitute benches of judges to hear specific cases. The composition of these benches which can be either single judge or multi judge benches is determined by the Chief Justice of India. This power is given to the CJI to reduce outside influence on the judges and to ensure judicial independence. Then the second power is regarding allocation of cases. The CJI as the master of roster has the power to assign cases to individual judges or benches. The CJI's power to allocate cases is not unlimited. So the CJA must exercise this power in a fair and impartial manner. In addition to this, the Chief Justice of India must also take into account the expertise of the judges on the different benches. In addition to this, the CJA must be mindful of the public interest. Okay? And the last power is regarding administrative control. The CJA exercises administrative control over the functioning of the Supreme Court including the distribution of cases, roster management and supervision of judicial work. Okay, Now having familiarized ourselves with the concept of master of roster, now let us see the points provided in the opaque article. See recently a division bench of the Supreme Court in Ritu Chabaria vs the Union of India case made a judgment to uphold an under trials right to be released on default bail. Here under trial is a person who is accused of a crime but still not convicted of the crime by a court of law. So basically under trial is a person who is awaiting a trial. See some investigation agencies file a charge sheet for the accused even before the full investigation is complete. This curtails the accused person's right to default bail. So to prevent this a division bench of the Supreme Court in Ritu Chabaria vs the Union of India case stated that an accused person's right to default bail will not be extinguished on the mere filing of a preliminary charge sheet. And the court reiterated that the right to bail can be curtailed only after the completion of the investigation. Okay, See the union government was displeased with the judgment given by the division bench of the Supreme Court. Normally what would happen in this scenario? In such scenario the union government will file for a review petition in the same division bench to reconsider the judgment. As per the Supreme Court rules 2013 a review petition must be filed within 30 days after the original judgment or order and must be placed before the same bench which had delivered the decision. But this normal scheme of things did not happen in the Ritu Chabaria case. Instead of filing a review petition, the union government opted for a recall application. Now what is the difference between review petition and recall application? See while considering a review petition, 
the court will consider if it had failed to consider any binding precedents or if there is any apparent error in the material on record or if some grave injustice has been caused as a consequence of the court's decisions also know that the review petition must be placed before the same bench as which delivered the decision in the first place this is about review petition now moving on to recall application see while considering an application to recall its own judgment or order courts including the supreme court and high courts are required only to look at whether the principles of national justice have been violated or if the court did not have the jurisdiction to consider the matter in the first place so basically in a recall application the court does not go into the merits but simply recalls an order which was passed also the recall application need not be filed before the same bench as in the case of review petition for example in the ritu chabaria versus the union of india case the union government placed a recall application before the chief justice of india and was not informed of the division bench that gave the judgment okay this is about the difference between the review petition and the recall application now coming back to ritu chabaria versus the union of india case see after the union government placed a recall application before the cji the cji accepted the application and gave an interim order directing courts to decide bail applications without relying on the judgment given by the division bench of the supreme court this is a major issue because any other bench or the cji deciding and recalling judgments of other benches amounts to an intra court appeal and intra court appeal is not a remedy available under the supreme court rules the chief justice of india by giving an interim order sidelining the judgment of the division bench as set a bad precedent and this is what what is the author of this oped article the author says that there is no legislative or constitutional backing for intra court appeal and the author feels that this move of the chief justice of india will lead to bench fishing or forum shopping here bench fishing or forum shopping refers to a practice where a party in a legal case tries to strategically choose a specific court or judge that they believe will be more favorable to their interests it involves seeking out a particular court or judge who is perceived to be sympathetic or more likely to rule in their favor see in india as we do not entertain intra court appeal the practice of bench fishing was kept under control now since intra court appeal is entertained instances of bench fishing will be back and this bench fishing or forum shopping can have a number of negative consequences on the judicial system it can lead to delays in the judicial process then it can increase the cost of litigation and it can even undermine the public's confidence in the judicial system the author feels that the root cause of the problem at hand stems from the issues with the master of rooster mechanism surely the master of rooster system has inherent administrative usefulness but at the same time there are many instances of abuse of power even in today's example the cji as master of rooster allowed for an intra court appellate mechanism within the supreme court and this is in total disregard of the established procedure this shows that the cji's powers as the master of rooster which is originally meant only for administrative decision making is now slipping into the judicial side okay this is the major issue associated with the master of rooster system and the other issues with the master of rooster system include lack of transparency then perceived bias in the allocation of cases and the issue of unequal distribution of workload okay so these are the issues associated with master of rooster system now how can these issues be addressed some have suggested that the power to allocate cases should be given to a committee of judges rather than to the chief justice of india alone others have suggested that the chief justice of india should be required to give reasons for his or her decisions about which cases will be heard by which benches so these are some steps that can be taken to address the issue with master of rooster system but the decision of whether or not to reform the system is a matter of the supreme court and the parliament of india so we have to just wait and watch what is going to happen in future and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the master of rooster system its advantages and disadvantages and finally the steps that can be taken to address the issues with the master of rooster system in addition to this we also see the difference between review petition and recall application and the issues associated with recall application okay see this topic is very much important for your mains exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article here it says that mr pravin kumar srivastava has been sworn in as the new central vigilance commissioner 
now in this context let us discuss about the central vigilance commission from prelims perspective see the central vigilance commission is the apex vigilance institution in india and it was established based on the recommendations of santanam committee it was established by an executive resolution of the central government in 1964 cvc acts as the main agency for preventing corruption in the central government and now that in 2003 the central government conferred statutory status to cvc by enacting the central vigilance commission act 2003 okay this is basic about central vigilance commission now we will look at the composition of central vigilance commission central vigilance commission is a multi member body it consists of central vigilance commissioner and not more than two members central vigilance commissioner acts as the chairperson and know that the central vigilance commissioner and two members are appointed by the president based on the recommendation of three member committee the committee consists of prime minister union home minister and leader of opposition in lok sabha now coming to the term the term of office of central vigilance commissioner and two members is 4 years or 65 years of age whichever is earlier one important point to note here is that after the completion of their tenure they are not eligible for further employment under the central or state government and this measure has been in practice to ensure them working in a free and fair manner without getting influenced by the ruling government now talking about the salary and allowances the salary and allowances of chief vigilance commissioner is similar to the chairman of upsc and the salary and allowances of other vigilance commissioner are similar to other members of upsc okay now coming to the jurisdiction see the jurisdiction of cvc is applied on many officers such officers and persons are displayed here you can pass the video and take a look at it now finally we will see some important functions of the central vigilance commission firstly the central vigilance commission conducts inquiries and investigation on central government employee who have been committed an offence under the prevention of corruption act 1988 secondly cvc enjoys control over the functioning of cbi with respect to investigation of offences under the prevention of corruption act thirdly cvc advises the central government and its authorities on matters referred to it by them and fourthly the director of prosecution is appointed based on the recommendation of cvc fifthly cvc are the specific authority to receive information related to suspicious transactions which come under the prevention of money laundering act 2002 and finally cvc are empowered to conduct preliminary inquiry into complaints referred by the lokpal in respect of government officials okay these are some of the important functions of central vigilance commission now we will look at the removal of members of cvc see the chief vigilance commissioner and other vigilance commissioners can be removed from the office by the president based on the following circumstances see the circumstances are given here you can go through it apart from this the president can also remove the central vigilance commissioner or any other vigilance commissioners on the grounds of proved misbehavior or incapacity in such cases president will refer the matter to the supreme court and if the supreme court upholds the removal then president can remove cvc and other vigilance commissioners okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about central vigilance commission then about its composition then about the removal of members and finally we saw some points about the functions of central vigilance commission see this topic is very much important for your prelims exam so make note of each and every facts that we discussed now let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this text and context article this article talks about the violence faced by healthcare professionals in india i hope you all remember dr vandana das she was stabbed to death in the line of duty in the kollam district of kerala so this news article is written in that context only now we shall see some of the important points mentioned in this article now before that the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here you can go through it now firstly we shall see who is facing the violence and what kind of violence they face see according to a survey published in the journal of post graduate medicine in july 2020 more than 50% of doctors had experienced verbal and physical abuse at the hands of their patients so verbal and physical abuse remains first in the list most importantly workplace violence is mostly directed at junior doctors and resident doctors than more senior healthcare workers the violence occurs more frequently in high stress environments like emergency rooms 
intensive care units that is icus are in departments that treat patients with impaired mental capabilities in 82.2 percentage of cases the perpetrators of workplace violence against physicians are family members or relatives of the patient while some perpetrators become violent over concerns of the patient's condition then others become violent due to issues like high payment of dues and lengthy wait times in essence female medical professionals with lesser years of experience are the victims of both physical and verbal violence now moving on to see about some of the effects of physical and verbal violence firstly in most of the cases doctors do not raise complaints to the police because they thinking that these experiences are part of their job this in turn leading to immense psychological impact that pushes them to take harsh decisions for example to keep themselves safe they choose resource abundant settings instead of rural health care where their presence is actually needed and they do not choose to offer emergency services fearing the consequence even we would have heard a doctor tell a patient to wait until the most senior doctor arrives then they also refer patients sooner to more specialists or over investigate symptoms and prescribe more tests apart from this they also tend to offer less life saving medical and surgical interventions that a patient may require this is because of the fear that a risky procedure may provoke violent action so in a larger picture all these activities will negatively affect the quality of healthcare okay so these are the effects of physical and verbal violence against healthcare professionals now we shall see what can be done to solve the issue see firstly to eliminate these threats we must spend more money to strengthen the system from the grassroots level this includes reducing long waiting periods for treatment then making medicines tests and financial aid readily available and accessible and improving their communication skills etc at the same time measures to mitigate workplace violence should also be taken apart from this more focus should be given on institutional and policy measures to avoid any threats for example there can be counselors to help patients and relatives in times of high emotional distress this can also eliminate any miscommunication regarding a patient's condition and treatment then institutional measures like installing cctv cameras and metal detectors at hospital entrances can also help to a larger extent in addition to this a robust security system and not allowing more than a few relatives by a patient's beside may also be important see if all these activities made through a law and enforced effectively it can convict offenders in a timely manner despite doctor requests for protective legislation such rules still do not exist which is worsening the situation so we shall wait for a statute that can improve indian trust in the indian healthcare system and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the violence faced by healthcare professionals then we moved on to see about the effects of the violence and finally we saw some points about how to solve the issue of violence against healthcare professionals now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this editorial page article here it says that india is going to get a new super computer later this year it will be the fastest in india and will be used for weather forecasting and other research the super computer is built by a french company named atos this super computer is going to arrive in india as a part of deal signed with the french in 2018 so in this context only this editorial article is written so in our discussion today we will see the points provided in this article now firstly what is a super computer a super computer or a high performance computing system is a powerful computing system which is designed to perform complex calculations and process large amounts of data at very high speeds the speed of the high performance computing system is usually measured in petaflops here flops means floating point operations per second and peta is unit of measurement denoting a factor of 10 to the power 15 so if a speed of high performance computing system is mentioned as 1 petaflops then such high performance computing system can perform 1000 trillion floating point operations per second okay this is about supercomputer now what are all the applications of supercomputer or high performance computing systems see the supercomputers are mainly used for solving intricate problems simulations data analysis and running advanced scientific applications some of the common applications of the supercomputer include weather forecasting aerospace engineering molecular modeling and 
drug discovery. In some cases, high performance computing systems are even used in financial modeling and high frequency stock trading. Okay. Now moving forward, let's take a look at some famous supercomputers in India, their location and uses. The first one is Param Siddhi AI. This supercomputer is located at the Center for Development of Advanced Computing, that is CDAC in Pune. It is the fastest supercomputer in India and is used for a variety of applications including weather forecasting, climate research and medical research. Currently, Param Siddhi AI is the only supercomputer from India that is one among top 100 fastest supercomputers in the world. Then there is another supercomputer called Mihir. This supercomputer is located at the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology that is IITM in Pune. It is used for weather forecasting and climate research. And the next supercomputer is Pratyush. This supercomputer is located at the National Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting in Noida. It is also used for weather forecasting and climate research. Now coming back to the editorial, see the supercomputer developed by French company named Atas is delivered later this year and it will become the fastest supercomputer in India. Like many other supercomputers in India, the supercomputer from France will be also primarily used to run sophisticated weather models. Okay, this is all about the supercomputing scenario in India. The author of the editorial is suggesting two measures for India. One is to increase the supercomputing capacity in India and the other is to transform the supercomputing ability into making a breakthrough in fundamental science and to engineer a new commercial product. This will help India in the long run. Okay. Now that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about what are supercomputers, then we saw about the application of supercomputers, then we moved on to see about the supercomputers present in India and finally we saw some points provided in the editorial. See this topic is very much important for your both prelims and mains. So make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now with these key points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this article here. The news is that the Asian Development Bank has approved a loan of 350 million US dollars for the economic stabilization of Sri Lanka. This program is a part of 3 billion US dollars financial assistance by the International Monetary Fund's Extended Fund of Facility for Sri Lanka. Okay, this is all about this news article given here. Now in this context, we look about the Asian Development Bank from exam perspective. Now let's start with the formation of Asian Development Bank. See Asian Development Bank which is shortly known as ADB was conceived in early 1960s as an Asian financial institution. A resolution was passed in this regard at the first ministerial conference on Asian Economic Cooperation which was organized by United Nations Economic Commission for Asia and the Far East in 1963. But the Asian Development Bank was established only on 19th December 1966 at Manila, Philippines. And know that Takeshi Watanabe was the first president of ADB and Masatsugu Asakawa serves as the current president of Asian Development Bank. Okay, this is basic about Asian Development Bank. Now moving on to see about the objectives of Asian Development Bank. Firstly, the Asian Development Bank aims to create a prosperous, inclusive, resilient and sustainable Asia and the Pacific. And secondly, Asian Development Bank strives to eradicate poverty in the Asia and Pacific region. Okay, these are the major objectives of Asian Development Bank. Now moving on to see about the members of Asian Development Bank. See Asian Development Bank had only 31 members when it was established but as of now it has 68 members. Out of 68 members, 49 members are from Asia and the Pacific and the remaining other members are from other parts of the world. Okay, the member nations of Asian Development Bank are displayed here. You can pause the video and take note of it. Now that's all regarding member countries. Now we will look at some of the major functions of Asian Development Bank. Firstly, the Asian Development Bank assists its members and partners by providing loans. Secondly, ADB provides technical assistance to its members. Thirdly, ADB provides grants and equity investments to promote social and economic development. Fourthly, ADB facilitates the policy dialogues to maximize the development impact of its assistance. And finally, ADB provides advisory services. Okay, so this is all about the major functions of Asian Development Bank. Now finally, we will look at India's membership in Asian Development Bank. Know that India is one of the founding members of ADB. That is, India became a member of ADB in 1966 itself. 
Now India is the fourth largest shareholder of the Asian Development Bank. Asian Development Bank and Indian government are working together to create more formal jobs and to address the climate challenges. Okay, and that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about Asian Development Bank, then about the objectives of Asian Development Bank, then we moved on to see about the members of Asian Development Bank. and we saw about the functions of asian development bank and finally we saw some points about india's membership in asian development bank see this topic is very much important for your prelims exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article here it says that india will train women from asian countries for united nations peacekeeping operations under the india asian defense cooperation See, there will be two initiatives in this regard. The first initiative is to provide training for twenty women, that is, two women from each ten Asian country members. And the second initiative is aimed at providing tabletop exercise for women officers from Asian countries by incorporating the challenges faced by the UN peacekeeping forces. This is the crux of the article given here. Now, in this discussion, we'll learn about UN peacekeeping force from an exam perspective. See the United Nations began its peacekeeping efforts in 1948 by deploying observers in West Asia. The purpose at the time was to monitor the armistice agreement between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Now coming to the objective of UN peacekeeping mission, the main aim of the UN peacekeeping mission is to assist the conflict-ridden countries to become a peaceful nation. It is a joint effort between the Department of Peace Operations and the Department of Operational Support. The UN peacekeepers will provide security, political support, and peace building support to countries which are affected by crisis. Okay, see there are three basic principles that guide UN's peacekeeping mission. Now let us look at them one by one. The first one is the consent of the parties. This means that to carry out UN peacekeeping mission, they firstly get approval from the member nations. Then the second one is impartiality. This refers to non being favorable or support to any of the parties involved. And the third and the final principle is non use of forces except in self defense and defense of the mandate. Okay, so these are the three basic principles that guide UN's peacekeeping mission. Now moving on to see about the important functions of UN peacekeeping force. Firstly, the UN peacekeeping force protects civilians and other UN personnel. Secondly, it monitors the disputed borders. Thirdly, it provides security in conflict-affected zones. Fourthly, it observes the peace processes in post-conflict areas. Fifthly, the UN peacekeeping forces provide security during elections. And finally, the forces assist in-country military personnel with training and support. Okay, this is all about the important functions of UN peacekeeping force. Now, finally, we will look at India's contribution in UN peacekeeping mission. So India is one of the largest contributors of the UN peacekeeping mission. More than 2 lakh 75,000 Indians have served in 49 peacekeeping missions since 1948. Currently, there are 5,900 Indians around the world for 12 ongoing UN peacekeeping missions. And most important point to note here is that India became the first country to use all women contingent to a UN peacekeeping mission. Okay, and that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about. UN peacekeeping mission then we saw about the objective of UN peacekeeping mission then we moved on to see about the three basic principles that guiding UN peacekeeping mission then we saw about the important functions of UN peacekeeping force and finally we saw some points about India's contribution to UN peacekeeping mission see this topic is important for your prelims exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss Preliminary practice questions. Now look at the first question. This question is regarding Asian Development Bank. Here two statements are given. We have to find the correct statements. Now look at the first statement. India is one of the founding members of the Asian Development Bank. As we saw in the discussion, India is one among the 31 founding members of Asian Development Bank. So statement one is correct. Now coming to the second statement. Currently, India is the second largest shareholder of the Asian Development Bank. See this statement is incorrect. As we saw in the discussion, India is the fourth largest shareholder of the Asian Development Bank. So second statement is incorrect. Here the question is asking for correct statements. So the correct answer is option A, one only. Moving on, let's take up the second question. This question is regarding National Supercomputing Mission. 
here three statements are given and we have to find how many of these three statements are correct now look at the first statement the national supercomputing machine is implemented and managed only by the department of electronics and information technology it is extreme statement right this statement is incorrect the national supercomputing machine is implemented and managed jointly by department of electronics and information technology and department of science and technology so statement one is incorrect now coming to the second statement the supercomputers developed under this machine are seamlessly integrated over national knowledge commission network see this statement is correct the national supercomputing machine envisages creating a national infrastructure for supercomputing systems and facilities of different size and scale distributed across the country by seamlessly integrated over national knowledge commission network so second statement is correct now coming to the third statement param siddhi ai is the only supercomputer in india with speed over 1 petaflops see this statement is also incorrect because other than param siddhi ai mihir pratyush param shwai etc are all having computing speed over 1 petaflops so third statement is incorrect from the given three statements only second statement is correct so the correct answer is option a only one moving on let's take up the final question this question is regarding u1 peace keeping force here two statements are given and we have to find how many of the given statements are correct now look at the first statement currently india is the top contributing country to the u1 peace keeping missions see this statement is incorrect because as per the march 2023 data bangladesh is the top contributor to the un peacekeeping force and not india so statement one is incorrect now coming to the second statement international day of united nations peacekeepers was celebrated on 29th may every year see this statement is correct the international day of united nations peacekeepers was celebrated on 29th may every year i know that the 75th un peacekeepers day was celebrated yesterday that is on 29th may 2023 so second statement is correct here the question is asking for correct statement since second statement alone is correct the correct answer is option b two only and this is the quiz question for you today i will post this quiz question in a community section try to answer it and the answer for the quiz question is posted in the comment section of the quiz question itself you can verify it and displayed here are the main questions for your practice go through the questions write your answers and post it in the comment section with this we have come to the end of the video if you liked our analysis please like comment and share and don't forget to subscribe to shankarais academy youtube channel now thank you for listening